Uh, hello everyone, welcome to my talk. Um, today I talk about uh, hard side red goes China following the unknown tail, uh, following the tail of an unknown backdoor. Um, in this talk I share um, an unknown backdoor and, and the way we tried to find out all of it possible. Um, I structured the talk in four parts. The first part is the initial detection part. So how did we detect the backdoor? The second part is um, a deep view or, or view into the technique. So talking about the di distribution about of the of the backdoor, talking about the capabilities of the malware, talking about the campaign and looking into the obf obfuscation attempts the malware does. The third part then concentrates on uh, communication and identification and interaction with the C2 servers of the of the malware. And we close the talk with a conclusion and look um, who is behind this attack. So, but first, some quick words about me. So, my name is Axel Wauer. I work for DCSO, Deutsche Cyber Sicherheitsorganisation in Germany. I'm a senior threat analyst. That's what my, my boss says. And I work together with Johan Aydimbas. Um, he is senior malware analyst. And Johan and I are also part of the outer team of our um, threat research blog um, called um, DCSO SciTech, um, where we publish our threat research, malware analysis, and so results of our daily work. Um, also, the blog actually is the result or the reason for the talk today. So in our first article we published, we analyzed um, malicious documents from Sidewinder and Indian APT. And I wrote a Jara rule to um, <coughs> hunt down the, the documents on VirusTotal. And as, as it is with all Jara rules, there are a lot of, not a lot, but some of them are false positives. And one of the false positives um, actually end up here and this and this document as you can see here um, it starts with um, with a lure document it's an RTF document called VPN instruction I translated it from Chinese I think um, if the document is, um, is um, executed or opened it writes down a executable called default exa and it executes an 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 exploit targeting the equation editor. It's an uh, exploit from 2017, which has re remote code execution abilities, uh, which then executes the default exa, um, which then itself tries to contact the C C uh, C2 server. This actually is nothing special, and see, we see this very often, but what got us hooked in this, uh, in this case was that this file tries to... Um, contact CNC server on a private IP address, 192 private IP address. So we were curious. We wanted to do a little bit OSINT research if anyone else can explain this. But we noticed, okay, there is no public analysis available or any talk or something. No one has analyzed this before. All AV signatures we found were... Um, generic or heuristic, so nothing really uh, what what uh, could help us. Only a V signet, the only a V signature which helped us was actually uh, one from Rising called um, Backdoor Hard Set Red. So this gives uh, the malware the name. It's from now on Hard Set Red, but still there was no no public knowledge available. Why we decided to okay, let's write a blog article about it. Maybe do a talk. So I'm here now. <laughs> um, so after deciding this, first question we want to answer was, okay, how does uh, how get the, the malware distributed? So we checked the distribution methods of the malware. Um, as I already explained, on the right side, we found um, the way to distribute the malware via malicious RTF documents and the equation editor exploit. Um, but we've also found a second one, which... Um, uses um, self-extracting archives, um, probably send via email to the user, and then executing this um, opens a lure executable, like in this case openvpn.exe, but it also um, executes in the background the default exe, which is hard set red. 
Um, interesting in this case actually is this we, that we can connect both um, distribution methods with each other because, oh, because um, they actually distribute the same sample. So we can link it to each, uh, to each other. Also, this is not like one case. Um, we found multiple cases where this happens. And um, on, or the only things uh, changing are the lure document names. For example, in this case, the lure document is named instruction for the use of tools on the private network of each department, dot doc, or the self-extracting uh, self archive, this, this time um, sends put again. So everything about this campaign actually is like focusing on VPN or remote connection or something like this, um, which we, um, which was for us enough. Okay, we, we know the distribution methods. Now we want to look into the capabilities of, of the malware. Um, so Johan started putting it in, in IDA and reversing it. And we, are, we can say that is an initial access tool, a uh, back, backdoor or Trojan, that is uh, written in C++ and that it has limited functionality, which means it can execute PowerShells, which he receives uh, PowerShell commands, with, uh, which he receives from the C2 server, replying with the standard out to the C2 server. It also can execute the PowerShell, uh, PowerShell script stored on the client, probably um, sent before. It also can write files, upload files, and theoretically, <laughs> it also can ping the C2 server, but um, the ping is actually buggy, and the whole code appears um, very inconsistent. Um, <laughs> We think that the, the malware developer here is more like a junior malware developer, so he's lacking skills. Um, um, call us, we would like to file a bug report here. Um, this adds also to that the, the malware comes with um, the PDP path included, which uh, in our case allows us to um, link the versions of the malware to, to the samples we found. So we found three versions, um, hard set 282, 290, and 291, the last one, which is actually very nice if you are looking for something and you hunt for something, you can structure it um, way better if you have the version numbers. Um, knowing how the malware was distributed and uh, what the malware actually does, we want to look a little bit more into the campaign. <laughs> so we wrote in Java rule and uh, hunt, uh, hunted down on virus total and collected everything on um, virus total graph, which ends up here. And um, we lost like a good overview, which is why we decided, okay, let's download all the samples, download all the file information from um, virus total uh, down to our machine and do um, analysis stuff for, uh, for ourselves. So this results in this nice graph explaining the um, or, or, or visualizing the campaign um, as you can see on the right side different colors represent different um, uh, uh, versions based on the, the um, PDP path and on on the on the y axis you can see that we we give we give every sample and sample ID um, yes on, on the on the x axis you have the related um, creation timestamp of the sample and the related first submission to virus total. So how do I read this graph? Um, for example, if I <laughs> want to know sample ID 20, um, pub is um, hard set 282, dark red, and um, arrow number one is the creation timestamp of the sample, um, something like the September 2020, and error number two, the green one, is the first submission to virus total of this sample. So this narrows down the actually use, the actually time the sample could be used or was deployed. Um, we are also aware that like timestamp in malware can be tempered, but for us they look uh, reliable. That's why we use them. Um, we also, you, um, we also. Um, can notice that there is like the red vertical bars here, which indicates that they probably 
created one gold sample and then just um, patched the IP addresses of the C2 servers into it when they used it. Um, yes, so do, now we know how to, to read the graph. Um, and this graph actually talks a lot, tells us, um, tells us a lot. So we know the campaign is ongoing sing, since two years. They heavily used the Hardset 282 version, but later switched to 2290, uh, which seems to be not that good. That's why they <laughs> directly published 289 shortly afterwards. Um, and in the right upper corner, they, um, in, so some months ago, they introduced um, packed samples of hard side red, so they tried to hide for us, but we have Yaha rules. <laughs> um, because we like the craft that much, we even added the, the timestamps of the RTF on the self-extracting files to the craft, and we, and we were surprised that they, they are even older than the samples itself, so this is also maybe something we want to write on Yaha rule in future. Um, because it looks like they, they, um, reuse the delivery methods. Um, okay, I already mentioned it. They, they introduced obfuscation attempts. This, and, um, this time obfuscation attempts means packing the malware. And we saw that they, um, do still develop the packer. So they started they started with a simple, simple approach, just encoding the, the sample with some base, uh, with base 360, uh, base 64, which we could easily extract with some one-liner bash script. Um, some weeks later, they improved and we couldn't, couldn't extract it with some bash script anymore. So we wrote our own base uh, 64 extractor for it. And then again, they improved um, from base 64 encoding to RS encrypting the payload, which forced us to write another another unpacking tool. And also they um, stripped the binary, so we lost um, the version the version number. <laughs> so having uh, so now we know the distribution the distribution ch uh, channel the the capabilities of the malware. We, we know um, something about the campaign and how, com uh, how long the campaign was ongoing. Um, now we wanted to, to look into the communication protocol, how it works, what it does. So we reversed the, the whole communication protocol and we can say, okay, the communication protocol is a custom protocol. Um, and in order to communicate with, this, with the C2 server, the client has to send an initial handshake and cookie, which consists out of a random value, an hard-coded value, 42, and a timestamp. And if you send this in this order, the, the C2 server responds with the first PowerShell command he wants the hardset read to execute. Of course, the whole communication is um, XOR encrypted, probably industry standard there. Um, the, and the key is again 42. Being able to speak the protocol and understand the protocol, um, we want uh, we wanted as next step to identify um, C2, C2 servers and to communicate with the C2 servers. So since we downloaded all the samples, we wrote a C2 server ex, uh, C2 server extractor. So we extracted all IP addresses, removed the private IP addresses, and mapped all the all the public IP addresses in order to get an overview. Here you can see all the C2 servers are located mostly in China, some uh, on a low number in, in Australia, Russia, US, Netherlands, and in, uh, and in Spain. Um, then, we, then we wrote an, an C2 server scanner, we called it, which just sends the first magic handshake to the C2 server and rates for the response of the C2 server. So, um, a lot of them didn't answer or wasn't online anymore, but we found 12 C2 servers online, which is, we were kind of happy and thrilled about it. Um, but we still don't know, and till now we don't know why the samples um, include um, private C2 IP addresses. We assume that it's maybe in compromised networks used for bridge, as bridgehead, that they have something like this in C2 server in the network, but we are not really sure. Anyway, um, since we found C2 servers, um, 
which um, did respond to to our initial handshake. We were thrilled and we wanted to keep the communication going, ongoing. Um, we improved we improved the protocol and tried to communicate with the with the C2 server over a long time and we locked all commands they sent to us. So um, I tried, I know it's not very um, good to read, but I tried to visualize it. The first block here is like client reconnaissance uh, for, for the client hardware. Then the second, the second part of, of the commands the C2 server sent is um, trying to steal um, logging credentials, like for example, um, Navicat um, database files, which is, is a database um, management software. We didn't know this before. Um, Team Fuel credentials, WeChat um, data, Git data, Chrome and Firefox and Edge browser data, and also um, iPod and iPod XML or something. Um, so because of the WeChat, we assume that the targeted victims are more or less located in the Asia area. Um, the, look, um, the server then st um, um, st um, finished sending the commands with um, trying to rec recognize um, the software on the system. Yes. Um, okay, let's talk about who is behind this attack. Um, and that is the point where we need to be honest. We don't know. It's like making attributions is hard. And making wrong attributions is very easy. But the only thing we can say right now is that we found the malicious RTF files. Um, as we were hunting for Sidewinder uh, documents. So, in an, which, um, so they are kind of uh, very similar to it. And we also found that Key on Sync Threat Intelligence in the Key on Sync Threat Intelligence Center published a report where they claimed that Sidewinder also used an VPN lure um, for uh, previous attacks. But as, I, but as I said already, at the moment there are too few indicators to make a reliable attribution. Okay, concluding this talk, um, before this talk, there were no uh, no analysis or any report available for this for this malware. Um, we will publish the uh, we will publish a blog article in two weeks about it. Along the anal uh, analysis, we found 120 samples. We could identify them. We identified two delivery techniques and three malware versions. Um, we still find. See two servers which are online and which we can communicate to. And we know that the campaign is ongoing since around about two years, aiming for initial access uh, creden and credential stealing. Uh, and we know that they focus on Asia and maybe even China, based on the lure documents. Um, since, since this is a CTI summit and we met here for like sharing knowledge and techniques we used to do, I was thinking, okay, maybe adding like one slide on how we did the analysis. So our our team is not very big, more or less <laughs> small. Um, and our motto here is like, build what you need, but keep it simple. So the tools we used there was like either, of course, for reversing, and mainly Python, PyCharm, and Jupyter Notebooks, and um, Virus Total API, for the for the analysis, um, the tools we created for the analysis we also want to publish with our blog article are the Base64 Unpacker, the IS Unpacker, the C2 Config Extractor. We also created a C2 Server Emulator to um, do like dynamic um, malware analysis and talk with the with with, with the sample and. We wrote also a C2 PCAP communication decryptor because we found um, some PCAPs on virus total as a result of the sandbox runs. So thank you for your attention. It's actually time for questions, but since I'm good in the time, I prepared like a one more thing slide, which is about after analyzing 
or, or finishing the, the analysis, even on the, at the end of a long analysis day, short before we want to like close the lid of the laptop, um, I tried to like, okay, it would be super nice if even the C2 server would provide the samples. Um, and I don't have to, have to, have to search them on virus total. I, I once saw the, this kind of URL, but didn't pay that much attention to it. So in the evening, I tried just at, okay, um, C2 server IP, C2 server port slash default Excel, which is the default name for the malware. And I was able to download the, the malware, which was like super nice. I spent one hour more, tried all the C2 servers we found and burned them all on virus total. So, which I will do in future as well. Okay. Thank you for attention. The time for questions. If you want to read the blog article in two weeks, then it's good to follow DCSO at SciTech on Twitter. Um, there we publish our research. Hello. Hey. Uh, I, I, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question about uh, if you know the victimology of uh, the the different campaign of this rat. Uh, again, can you can you repeat it? Ah, okay. Uh, uh, have you have you an idea about the victimology of uh, of uh, the victims? Yeah. Um, actually, actually, not not really. Um, no, no. <laughs> I, I, a simple question. From the translated text in China, Chinese, you didn't get information about the VPN connection. Not, not about. Also, you can send it to like everyone. Also, as a company is probably. So it's generic. It's quite generic. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I think there were one more question there. Hi. Hey. Um, how much time did it take from the first investigation to? Uh, your last try? Um, doing this investigation, this is like kind of a side project, but we, we spent like around a little bit than one, more than one day per week. And it's like, we did it for three months. So we, we, um, traced it over a long, long time of period, I, I would say. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> if my bot, boss would ask, I would say less. <laughs> I don't know if there are more questions. In the meantime, I have a one question for you. Um, you mentioned initially it was a Yara rules that you used that find out by accident this rat. Yes. Um, how do you catalog and qualify all your Yara rules? If you have, for example, a Yara rule that is like overmatching something and then you create a new one, do you have a kind of methodologies for classifying all your Yara rules or is it just like Cheerlux or? No, we're not that like sophisticated. We have just a bunch of arrows. We don't classify them. We, we have them. And as long we, we are happy with them, we use them. And if they, if we're not happy because there's too much false, false positive, we delete them. And depends on how, how long we track threat actor. <laughs> Great. Thanks. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot. Uh, no more questions?